Good morning, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this conversation across borders on feminism in a time of Black Lives Matter. For those who do not know me, I am Barbara Pozzo and I am the holder of the UNESCO Chair on uh, uh, Gender Equality and Women's Rights in the Multicultural Society at the University of uh, Insubria. Let me immediately introduce to you our distinguished guest speaker of today's conversation, Professor Tania Hernandez. Morning, Professor Hernandez. Good morning, Tania. <laughs> Professor Hernandez is the Archibald Murray Professor of Law and Associate Director of the Fordham Center on Race, Law and Justice at Fordham University, New York. She teaches discrimination law, Latin American law, employment, trust and wills, critical race theory and the science of implicit bias on which we will come back later on. She has a number of books and articles published on uh, this matter in uh, which she has developed her research. And now a few words about the UNESCO chair uh, before beginning the conversation with Professor Hernandez. The UNESCO chair on gender and equality and women's rights in the multicultural society was established two years ago at the University of Insubria. Among the activities that the chair, the, the chair is organizing, uh, there is a course on the evolution of women's rights in a comparative law perspective and the challenges of the multicultural society. The chair is part of the global network of UNESCO chairs on gender, a network that is now coordinated by Professor Gloria Bonder, the founder of the interdisciplinary postgraduate women's studies program at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, whom I thank very much for her work and efforts that she's doing in coordinating our network. Um, since its establishment, the chair has been cooperating with the project on prevention and contrast to violence against women between law and culture that has been financed by the region Lombardy, the region in, in where our University of Insubria has its seat. And, um, and that has been coordinated by Professor Valentina Iacometti, who is here with us today and who will help us coordinating the final question time. Good morning, Valentina. Good morning, Good morning Professor morning, everyone. Um, lastly, uh, the chair has recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Suroptimist International of Italy, which is a worldwide volunteer service organization for women that works to improve the lives of women and girls in local communities and throughout the world, and that celebrates its anniversary exactly today. So finally, some organizational indications. Uh, at the end of this meeting, uh, we will have a Q&A time, but you can send the questions already now in the chat and go on writing through the end of our conversation. You can write in English or in Italian. Uh, and coming back, coming back to our distinguished guest, uh, Professor Tanya Hernandez is regularly collaborating with the UNESCO chair, teaching to our students as visiting professor, generally in the month of May of every year. But unfortunately, this year, due to the pandemic, it was not possible to have you here in person. And that is why we organized this conversation to have you with us at least virtually. But this is also the possible the occasion, if you want, it is the civil island in, of the cloud uh, to have it of this pandemic situation, to be able to share with many people your uh, presence here with us. So thank you for being here today with us, Tanya. And uh, let us begin this conversation, <laughs> which is the main topic of our meeting today. So uh, the movement of Black, of Black Lives Matter was founded by Alicia Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opal Tometi. Three women, three women that advocate for nonviolent civil disobedience in protest against incidents of police brutality and all racially motivated violence against black people. 
how do you consider uh, the fact that the initiative was uh, taken exactly by three women? Well, I think what's important to note here is that, yes, it was three women, but it was three black women. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and the reason why I'm being very specific, and I know that for some audiences that can seem a bit um, alarming um, and for some even just mentioning or being specific about someone's racial identity can sound off alarms. It's like, oh, that sounds racist to me. Um, but here, what I want to take note of is that their uh, identities as black women was very much what informed their concern because black feminism has always been intersectional. Black feminism, uh, since uh, African slaves were brought to the shores of the, what we call now call the United States, uh, have been concerned with issues that affect people of color and also women because we live in these intersectional ways. Um, and so to see black men dying on the streets and black women as well um, is not only an issue for us of racism, but it's also an issue for us of feminism, uh, of caretaking, uh, of being civic, civically engaged in ways that speak to our intersectional, that is our gender and our race coming together uh, to inform our perspective on things. And so those three women that you uh, mentioned as founders of hashtag Black Lives Matter are all not only women, but black women. Yes, but uh, looking to the media, the first impression that you get is that this violence that police is perpetrating is a male matter between men, something between men. But is it really so? That has been another fascinating part about the way in which uh, this era of, of civil rights activism, uh, as led by women, um, or at least informed by the perspectives of women, uh, has been trying to open up right, the perspective. That is to say, the media, it is true in the United States, for the most part, focuses just on the violence against black men. And certainly that is a significant problem. I don't mean to at, at all uh, dismiss that right, or diminish. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know. But uh, at the very same time that hashtag Black Lives Matter is being promoted, these women and others, uh, and in collaboration with our um, white sister allies, <laughs> have been promoting <laughs> another hashtag, which the media doesn't promote as much. And this other hashtag is called hashtag Say Her Name. Yeah. And what hashtag say her name is trying to make visible are all the black women in particular and also women of color who are also very vulnerable and um, disproportionately targeted by the police with their racialized violence. Um, you know, just like um, all the media attention to the black men who are unarmed, who have not been involved in any kind of altercation with the police. So it's sort of it, it, it highlights the way in which uh, the police violence is all about their own, the police's own racialized perspectives about the inherent dangerousness of a black body. You see that as well uh, in the way in which they target black women uh, so that uh, black women who are just alone in their apartment trying to sleep right, uh, can be predisposed to having the police barge in um, presumably to investigate um, some kind of crime and come in both with their guns and kill. Uh, th this is the scenario that right now that Breonna Taylor uh, is being lifted up by the hashtag say her name movement. So the, you know, it's, it's important to have the media attention, but at the same time, the media attention can also distort because mm -hmm. it distorts in ways um, that, uh, diminish the role, not, not only the role of women in leadership, but also the role of women as victims as well. Yes, because in fact, you were saying that uh, women victims don't show up very uh, frequently in the media, but also the three founders of hashtag Black Lives Matter have not so much popularity in the media or, or not, or is it... Uh, well, you know, what's interesting about that, I think, is that it's a combination of uh, two things. One, there's the, the, male pers the, the male perspective that informs what the media, yeah. who, who is part of the media, right? um, and, and who is um, 
thought as important. Then the other thing that's uh, interfacing here is that the women who are founders of Black Lives Matter also lead with, um, dare I say it, a feminine perspective. That is to say mm -hmm. that it is um, a leadership style that does not want to elevate someone as boss, but instead work in a very collaborative manner. Uh, and have all the protests that you see on the ground really be um, authentically from the people in the communities. Right? So as opposed to a very traditional male leadership role, which is top down, you know, I'm the head of the NAACP, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> colored people. Um, and I decide that now we are going to do this intervention or that intervention in form the little people on the street uh, to fall in line accordingly. Uh, you know, these are all ways of moving progress forward, but that's a very male style. Uh, Black Lives Matter instead is informed by a female perspective about the importance of collaboration, of having all voices heard, um, of having everyone matter. Uh, and so it is less hierarchical. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and I guess uh, to say it more succinctly, these women are not putting themselves forward as I am the boss of the organization and I'm, I'm here to lead. Um, instead, they're very much about listen to the people on the street. They're the ones who matter. Yeah, yeah, I perfectly understand. And uh, the the other thing that I would like to discuss with you, talking about the role of women or black women in, uh, uh, in the history of also civil rights movement is that uh, uh, women have always been there. Uh, they have always been black women activists like Rosa Parks. And uh, I was wondering, do you think that anything, if anything has changed in the role of women as activists or as leaders, even if you speak about a very feminine pers perspective on leadership? Well, you know, uh, two things come to mind. One is that um, the intersectional perspective that is sort of helping inform hashtag Black Lives Matter um, sort of garner the um, attention and support that it has. Um, that intersectional perspective is also one that comes from a history of having been involved in civil rights movement where our effort, our labor uh, has been very instrumental, but we have not been viewed as the leaders. That is to say, you know, you could have a Rosa Parks who's kind of put forth as a symbol, but she's not made the head of the NAACP. Um, you know, the men are at the forefront. And the men are uh, instead, or are historically, right, you know, black men uh, have looked to the women who were part of the organizations um, in, in many ways as sort of being supporting role figures as opposed to the leadership role figures. And so being, ha having an intersectional perspective, you know, comes with all kinds of different consequences. Um, that is to say, uh, you know, Black women are affected by their racial appearance right, to the outside world, but they're also affected uh, as being female within their own communities and all the patriarchy that that implies within any kind of historical perspective about interactions between men and, and, and women. But if you'll permit me just a slight divergence, of um, course. Because when bringing up Rosa Parks also um, brings to mind for me the way in which you know, she's known historically and, you know, and all the little storybooks and everything, um, but, you know, sitting in the front of the bus and, and not putting up with any of this nonsense of segregation um, in public spheres in the United States. But what she's less known for, but and she did before she was working um, on these issues of solely about racial segregation, she was working on uh, violence against women. Uh, she was organizing um, at least a decade before uh, if I recall correctly, um, because of rapes of black women, black working women, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, way in which the police would not investigate and would not take it seriously. Um, and so she was very much about mobilizing communities to try to bring justice uh, for the black women who were ra raped, you know, also as part of white supremacist ordering in the United States of that time in the 1940s. Um, so, you know, she was an activist and she was a leader long before anyone sort of recognized her as that little sweet old lady sitting in the front of the bus. Um, you know, she was fighting for uh, women's rights, but again, from her intersectional uh, perspective as a black woman. 
So in some respects, some people think of her yes. as one of the early people working against issues of sexual violence and sexual harassment. Yes, thank you, Tanya. This makes uh, uh, me remind of, uh, of something that I was told very recently. A few weeks ago, we interviewed an 88-year-old uh, member of the parliament, a lady who recently uh, published a book that translating from the Italian could sound like for jealousy of love, per gelosia d'amore, which was the, ti the title is given uh, um, by the fact that uh, several judges uh, during the period 1865, so from the very beginning of the kingdom of Italy to the fascist era, when um, when a, when a, when a girl when a woman was uh, raped or killed or blessed or bounded, at, and if it was the husband or the fiance or I mean somebody who had a special relationship with her, at the end uh, the the claim was always dismissed because the judges found out that it was done for jealousy of love, huh? which is the very particular. But the same person, the same person who came um, to the university and uh, was interviewed uh, in order to present her book, uh, was also saying that she participated to the 68 movement here in Italy. So when students protested and what she was uh, telling us is that uh, even there, the protest was considered a male question and the, the ladies, the girls, had a mere supportive role, so that is to say, well, I'm the leader, you, of course, you are allowed <laughs> to support me in my fight. So this is something which is uh, actually, I, I find a, a terrible uh, parallelism in this, uh, in what, what that you were saying. So um, speaking uh, about discrimination, I mean, discrimination for race, discrimination on the ground of gender, uh, let us talk for a moment about the other movement uh, uh, that recently rose uh, to the headlines, the Me Too movement. So Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter, is there any connection between them, at least in terms of awareness raising phenomena? Well, you know, fascinating here to look at the two uh, movements side by side in this way, um, because hashtag Me Too took off, you know, um, yeah. because with the Hollywood uh, starlets uh, all across the newspapers, um, there's a way in which it fed um, the public uh, consumption, right, of an adoration of the female starlet. And so anything that's happening to someone in Hollywood is viewed as more in interesting and informative, et cetera. Um, but what is uh, important to note is that mm -hmm. the language hashtag me too existed a decade before you have our Hollywood female stars huh. bringing it to attention. Who uses it? A black female nonprofit owner who is trying to use it to create awareness about the violence and the sexual violence against black women and black girls. Um, and so it was a consciousness raising um, phrase that she would use, sort of that to create support amongst women because we're often so silenced and we are embarrassed and we are mortified and we're in trauma uh, for the violence that has been done uh, to our to our bodies and to our minds. Um, and so Me Too was all about sort of bringing these women together for healing and these girls as well. And so it existed for, you know, again, a <laughs> decade before by a black woman. Um, and the, then when, once a Hollywood starlet tweets it, boom, all of a sudden it gets a lot more attention. Well, mm -hmm. so that's one thing to notice about it. But if you will permit me. <laughs> yes, yes, I permit I, you. <laughs> if I go on, go on too long about this, but I get very animated about um, this particular uh, comparison between the two movements because the comparison yields so many interesting and useful insights about the way in which feminism and um, uh, racial justice are viewed as separate often um, in ways that can be problematic. So hashtag um, me too. Uh, you know, takes off and gets all this attention um, because the it, the media portrays it as about, you know, 
beautiful white women who are being targeted and harmed. And don't get me wrong. I think that's wrong, right? I don't think it's right. And I don't think it's excusable that just because you are beautiful, you know, that um, you should uh, be targeted for harm in that way. Um, but I say it in this somewhat sort of facetious tone because there are tons of working class women on assembly lines, working in factories who take even more heat. It's a sort of expression we use in the United States. That is to say, they are more disproportionately targeted uh, for sexual harassment uh, right, than you know, people in white collar jobs and people who are CEOs, or, although even C female CEOs ha um, have experienced sexual harassment as well. Um, but not to take us too far afield from our topic for today. Um, I only bring it up to say this, um, that hashtag me too as it's portrayed and where all the support comes from doesn't really uh encompass the ways in which the sexual harassment sexual violence of women is much more global broad based and affecting many more women both of course socioeconomic lines and also racial and ethnic lines now but to also look at it with um, hashtag Black Lives Matter, sort of you know, uh, the, the dualism of the two is that part of what hashtag Me Too promotes, and I believe this is you know an appropriate thing to do, is to say you know believe women, and I think mm -hmm. it's important you know because yes, our course. historical backdrop has been that we don't believe women, right? Uh, uh, even so, even the um, Example that you brought forth from, you know, an antiquated Italian moment in history where husbands, you know, never could get to be prosecuted for the rape of their wives. We had that as part of our law for the longest time in the United States. You know, that what, what men did, what husbands did to wives was never rape. Just because they were a husband and a wife, you know, totally alien. That's a whole other UNESCO chair uh, conversation for us to have. <laughs> but, <laughs> But what uh, what I think is important to note about that um, is that part of saying believe women can also be misconstrued and misinterpreted to as part of what we call cancel culture. That is to say, you've been accused, and even if it's just one person is accusing, you need to lose your job. You need to have your reputation maligned. You're off the stage. You're dead to us as part of, you know, being part of society. It's the shunning. Okay. But here's the problem with that. No due process. Yes, it's a woman who's making the accusation, but, you know, as lawyers, <laughs> it's should, more, yeah. right? you and I and Valentina and others in the room, right? we know that um, you have to investigate first. You have to have standards of uh, evidence to then, you know, weigh, you know, is someone's perspective of what they believe happened to them in actuality, what others, objectively speaking, would say is a rape, is harassment, et cetera. I know that might sound very odd coming out of this feminist mouth, but I do believe in due process. Now, why, does, why do I bring this um, up at the same time as saying compare Black Lives Matter with hashtag me too? Because unfortunately, mm -hmm. What also doesn't get put forth in the media right, is the disproportionate of black males who get accused of sexual harassment and rape, right? and often by white women. And historically, that has been sort of part of our slave history legacy, um, that white woman says a black male has, uh, or it's presumed somehow that their intimacy is a rape, and there goes the lynching. Right? Um, yeah. And we see it in the statistics, interestingly enough, in for just take one case example, on college campuses where black male students are a small number, you know, in, in elite you know, a, a Harvard, a Yale, a Cornell, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so black male students are smaller in number, but they are disproportionately the students who are accused of sexual harassment of white female students. What happened to all the white men? What happened to all the white men in fraternities who drink and who are known when drinking to rape women, with the female students? So, um, the, the, the important thing I think about putting these two movements together is that the, at least in the United States, you cannot put a pull apart the attention that needs to be brought to bear on both how racism and sexism intertwine in ways that are problematic 
for the entire society. Um, and that while for sort of trying to illuminate and make important one form of harm, that we're not doing another form of harm as well. And so, you know, so all, to, to, to say this, you know, all of it is very complicated, not impossible to address, obviously, but complicated and needs sort of nuanced attention. Mm -hmm. And this actually brings me to the next question <laughs> to you. <laughs> because when we speak about feminism, I always have the impression that we speak about two similar things, but not exactly the same thing when a European woman and a, a, an American woman talk together, right? Well, <laughs> I would add even another layer to that. Mm -hmm. When put three women in the room, a, woman, a white European woman, I will yeah. be specific, or white appearing, uh, yeah. <laughs> a white U.S. woman, and let's just say a black U.S. Yes. woman. Those can be three very different Good perspectives point. about, what, about what feminism mean. <laughs> um, be, and, and here's the thing. In the United States, unfortunately, um, when you say feminism, the immediate image that comes to mind, and we see it in all the news reports, et cetera, and we're the spokespeople saying feminism, it's a white woman's face. It, it, as if black women, oh, that's only about race issues. <laughs> it can't also be about feminism. Um, and so that black feminism has had a somewhat of a, as they say in social media postings, complicated uh, status, a <laughs> relationship with feminism because of its white uh, characterization in the United States. And off, also, I have to say, part of the history of white feminism often wanting to have only one single kind of feminism instead of feminisms, plural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that if you're not talking about feminist issues that only matter to white women, and here I have to be even more specific, elite white women, because they often leave their sisters in the factory behind, um, <laughs> all this concern about, you know, at, issues about um, the right to a abortion, understood. But you know what What many women on the factory lines really also care about? Just having a right to contraception. They get a, but for them, and, and healthcare, in the United States, we don't have you know right yeah. to health. Um, many, many issues here to talk about. Um, but the uh, fraught relationship between uh, what sort of is a white feminist perspective and a black feminist perspective also comes from years of white feminism saying you have to be on board with our definition then otherwise you're not a true feminist you're letting other things get in the way and we should all have a universalist idea because we're all women we all immediately are positioned exactly the same way vis-a-vis -vis patriarchy and that's not entirely true Right. Um, our position or with respect to patriarchy can be quite fluid, actually. Right? It not only depends sort of what your socioeconomic status is and your race and ethnic background. It also matters who your family is, who, you know, what kind of support did you get from the male figures in your family? Who, who, who you're in the room with at the time? Who are your mentors? You know, some of us do quite well within a patriarchal society and some of us don't. And so um, it's not to say that there isn't something called feminism that needs to um, be supported uh, and uh, rallied around, right? Um, but the, what we call feminism needs to be a much bigger tent. Hmm. Well, Talking about feminism and icons of uh, the movement on feminists, let me turn uh, for a moment to, to an important uh, person who actually died this year in September. I'm talking about uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I would like to share with you and with the audience a quotation that she uh, once uh, uh, said in, uh, during a conference, uh, she said, when I am sometimes asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And I say, when there will be nine, people are shocked. But there have been nine men and nobody's ever raised a question about that. Hmm? 
So Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, raised an important question about gender representation in, uh, in, with this quotation, with this declaration. But uh, at the same time, uh, maybe you can tell us something um, from a different approach about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, because uh, of course uh, we are talking about racism and feminism together. And uh, I think this is an, a very important example of what can be done and uh, also about the evolution on of what somebody can think about these two issues. Well, you know, um, I always love when I hear that quotation, right? Um, because it's so emblematic of how the justice was always sort of yeah. said it like it was, like, you know, you boys have been in leadership roles and in all the public spaces for lo the millennium. If we want to have representation where it's all women, so be it. You know, it's our turn. And so I always like that about her. <laughs> um, but what's, you know, interesting to note her is that just like each of us, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a human being uh, and a human being uh, as imperfect um, and as subject to foibles and her own cultural upbringing as anyone else. Right. Um, and so. Uh, when Ruth Ginsburg had been on the uh, court for quite some time, it was brought to her attention that she had a record, because we keep statistical records of who gets hired, et cetera, uh, of never hiring any black clerks. Each year, the Supreme Court justices hire at least two clerks to assist them. They are law school graduates of the most talented of the crop because they are instrumental in doing the research and helping the judges, uh, justices think through these important legal matters. Right, So those are like coveted jobs. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, but everybody wants those jobs. Yes. That's very prestigious. Very prestigious. And she was yeah. good about hiring women, but there were always white women. Never a single black person in many, 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 many years right, of hiring uh, a, a law clerks. And what she came to understand, but th she needed to have her eyes opened. And she readily admits this, like this, you know, this is on the record. I'm not talking badly about the justice. I'm not saying anything she would have, would, did not already say about herself while she was alive. Um, that her implicit biases, meaning her unconscious cultural upbringing, didn't make her think about being proactive about considering candidates of color. She just used what was her own default of, okay, this is the person who um, has all the very same credentials that I have, went to all the very same schools that I did. I mean, if your networks and your view of merit are just very narrow, you will never have an alternative perspectives. Right? So to think about it for a moment from, you know, why in Europe is that the, the whole movement to have the CEO right, of publicly traded organizations have female representation is because left to their own devices, people tend to pick the very same people that reflect their own image. Right? Um, and they think they're doing it for meritocratic reasons. I mean, there's some bad folks who are, you know, do bad things because they want to do bad. <laughs> but there are a lot more, there are a lot, many, many, many others who instead are just acting on what they think is a meritocratic analysis. And instead, it's just their own intuitions right? uh, as informed only by their own experience. Right? And so they're not sort of looking for where all the talent is. Now, this also, just to kind of tie this together with some of the other things we were talking about that I should have mentioned. Um, it also then influenced how uh, the justice and so many other white feminists of her era and before um, didn't think of sexual harassment as having anything to do with race. Their notion was that sexual harassment is a horrible dynamic that happens to women because they are women. Um, and certainly we have a lot of evidence that, ha that that's the case, um, but that it also affects uh, gender non-conforming men as well. So meaning, if you look or perceive to be the least bit feminism, feminine, you are subject to being harassed in the workplace if you are a male, or at least that has historically been the case. Um, but well, how does race come into the issue of sexual harassment? Well, when we look at the statistics, what we find is that women of color and black women in particular 
across all occupational fields, across those all socioeconomic statuses, so you know, college professors and women on the assembly line, all of them are much more predisposed to being sexually harassed than their white female counterparts. So that is to say, with sexual harassment, there's a way in which racial harassment is combined and um, it generates um, the sexual harassment as well. Um, and yet, and so what that also means then is that interventions need to pay attention to that intersection as well. Because if you're only looking for sort of where is sort of the uh, sexy part <laughs> of sexual harassment, right? you're going to miss all the ways in which the sexual assault was accompanied not by sexist uh, phrases, but a lot of racial, racial, sexualized racial commentary. Right? Um, and that that is generating the assault against the woman in the workplace in other public spheres. So um, this issue of our unconscious biases, or as um, social psychologists call them, implicit biases, it affects people in their hiring, like Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, lover, may she rest in peace, right? um, and also <laughs> our legal doctrines. How, how, what do we think sexual harassment is really about and who it affects and how and what sort of interventions should we have in place? You know, this is something that you know all of us need to think much more deeply about. Um, not only all the uh, people in the world who are overtly and intentionally seeking to be sexist and racist and problematic in so many other kinds of ways uh, that law speaks against, but also those of us who are complicit in sustaining patriarchal and racialized societies because we're not uh, sort of checking the way in which our own implicit biases are being brought to bear. We so meaning how did um, the justices uh, implicit biases come to light? It is like we go inside her head and act, you know, Bear it in there in her uh, in her subconscious. It's not a Freudian analysis. Is that that I am promoting here? Uh, what uh, should be brought to bear is to look then at what your actions reveal. Be an accountant about it. Take an inventory like a shopkeeper. Like when she saw the ways in which year after year after year, she never thought any of the sort of talented black graduates from the top universities, because they we do have them, right? It's not a pipeline problem. It's not an issue of, there weren't any that I could select. Woe is me. No, they were there. She just wasn't looking at them. No. But when that was brought to her attention, she could intervene into mm -hmm. her list of biases, right? So you know, we're not a victim um, to our unconscious. We just need to be a, bring attention to the way in which our unconscious drives results. And just by how? By looking what the results show us uh, as a reflection of how, what our unconscious um, attitudes are. Yes, this, uh, this uh, um, issue of uh, implicit bias is uh, an issue on which you have uh, uh, also read uh, uh, several articles, Tanya. And I think it's very important also because uh, uh, it appears to me that uh, while in the United States uh, uh, a certain legal literature begins to develop on this issue, in Europe uh, it's not so much the case. So uh, just to tell a little bit more to the, to the students as well, so implicit bias refers to the unconscious attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions. And these biases, which can encompass both favorable and, of course, also unfavorable assessments. So a white woman is better than black woman, which is worse, or black man worse than white man, or on the contrary, in some cases, oh, no, I prefer this to that and so on. Well, anyway, um, uh, this, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this question, I think, is uh, uh, also very important because it, it makes us understand, as in the case of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that if we spread out the idea that there are some tools to become more aware, hmm, to become more aware of our own stereotypes, of our own uh, implicit biases, because uh, we are, it is implicit because it is it is something that we are not aware of. We are not speaking, as you were saying before, about the bad ones who want to do bad things. We are speaking about 
the people who are not aware of what they really think. And so I think it's very important to have this awareness process introduced in our classrooms, because when we speak about the equality principle, uh, you know, <laughs> equality can be uh, interpreted uh, as uh, the history of the United States um, very well teaches us uh, uh, since the case of Plessy against uh, uh, Ferguson. But uh, mm, in this field, which, which can be the, the, the role of lawyers? Also for us, comparative lawyers who are always very curious of what is happening in other countries, in other legal systems, uh, which could be the role of lawyers in spreading out these uh, um, discourse on implicit bias? Well, you know, the important, th the important thing to keep in mind, right, is that we as lawyers, we affect the world not only directly by the clients we represent um, or the um, ideas that we put forth as public intellectuals, you know, in our commentary in the press, in the articles that we write, in the books that we publish, um, uh, but we also affect the world in what we define as a problem. Uh, so this is sort of a universal um, precept that I'm going to describe right now, and that affects the United States and so many other jurisdictions. And as a comparatist mm -hmm. myself, right now, um, I, I, I like to do the comparing too. Um, and that's this idea that discrimination, mm -hmm. sexism, racism, etc., mm -hmm. ableism, mm -hmm, that it's all about problems of people who intentionally, explicitly decide, oh, I hate women. So I'm going to bar them from the workplace. That's the central way in which discrimination law operates. Now we have exceptions. We have statutory perspectives that we, as lawyers, you know, we've been trying to infuse and, and break out from. But at the as a foundational matter, this idea about intentionality is a central operating. A mode of analysis. And here's why that is so problematic. And this is where lawyers could really benefit from at least consulting and learning and educating themselves a little bit about um, the literature on implicit bias. And I'll uh, give some little tips about where to look for things right? um, in a moment. But first, just let me kind of uh, stretch out a little bit um, what I mean here about how lawyers can be informative. When we look at the literature about implicit bias, what we discover right, is that people's explicit acknowledgement of their own biases, you know, like I will admit, I'm a bit biased ab about age. Even as I age, I have attitudes about what old people are capable and not capable of doing, right, which my mother calls me on all the time. You know? <laughs> And I'm unable to do X, Y, and Z because I assume because she's old that she, you know, she can't do stuff. Right? So that, that's an explicit attitude of mine, which I know is problematic, but I explicitly know I harbor it. What studies find time and time again is that people's own explicit acknowledgments of what their attitudes are are less predictive right, mm -hmm. of their actions than their unconscious biases. Now you may be wondering, it's like how how can you study this? How could you possibly know? The social psychologists are doing amazing work for these over the past few decades. And what they have um, developed, both in experiments and also in um, actual participant observation and what have you, is the uh, construct of something called the implicit association test, or IAT for short, implicit association test. And what this does is it can actually measure as a metric sort of the extent of your association between a particular kind of person or attribute and its value, right? Meaning you think of it as good or bad. And the way this gets measured is by, uh, and, and I should uh, also say that you don't have to, to dig deep to find uh, an example of how the test operates because uh, Harvard University freely on its public website, if you go to Harvard University, just put in the Google, Harvard University and implicit association tests, 
and it'll pop right up for you on the screen and you can take a free test um, to measure your implicit bias in about, any language in any language because that is they, very important thing. So all of this all of this work is quite global there's social psychologists across all of these many jurisdictions so when i've done it in italy i've i've shown examples <laughs> of the italian implicit association test lots of fun um and so what you can do is take these tests and th then measure implicit biases along, I think like 20 different kinds of metrics. So, you know, whatever you're curious about, learning a little bit more about yourself about race, gender, uh, Muslim, Arab identity, religion, uh, size, you know, so lot, there are a lot more people do, who um, ha have attitudes right, about one's physical uh, appearance, um, you know, People who are viewed as heavy set don't get hired at the same rates as people who are viewed as felt and pleasing looking. Right? Anyway, uh, let me not get sidetracked. Back to the implicit association test. So what this test does right, is it get, presents you with an image on the screen and then asks you to pair it with a particular uh, value. So it'll say every time you see, let's talk about se sexism, right? Every time you see a female face on the screen, uh, you are instructed to press the right hand key, right? You know, uh, and every time you see a male face, press the left hand key. And it also will ask you every time you see um, a word associated with um, intellect, smart, powerful, etc., also hit the right hand key. And then they'll switch it up. This is what they find. Anyone who has a long time to take the test can do it practically 100%. Every time you see the face, every time you see the word, you press the correct key. But when we ask you to do it quickly, your implicit biases start to come to the surface. Because when you have to act quickly, what they find is many more errors occur when you are asked to be pairing the female face on the screen with the right hand button, along with intellect and the right hand button. Much slower, many more errors than when it's the male face on the screen and the right hand button and intellect. It takes much longer for me to describe a test than you to take the test. So I highly encourage you all to go out there and, you know, just do it for free. It takes about 15 minutes and you'll see it in operation. It's a much more powerful kind of a um, illumination. Uh, now, here's the other thing, though. Once you take the test, and I don't want you to be fearful about taking the test, it doesn't label anyone sexist, racist, you know, big racial bigot. It doesn't do that. What the test simply measures is the strength of your association between a particular attribute and a value system at that moment in time. Implicit biases are quite fluid. Why are they fluid? Because when you bring them to bear, that is to say, when you are explicit in acknowledging your own implicit biases, you can intervene in them. So I started off this example with um, my own explicit attitude about people's age. What does that mean? That means that I know I have this. Everything I've watched on television, all the jokes about old people needing to have their driver's license taken away from them because they're just terrible on the road. Yes, there may be some old people who should have their driver's license taken away from them, but not every old person needs to. My mother's eyesight is better than mine. I'm the one with the glaucoma and the retinal <laughs> attachment. You and also, you know, I got the bad set of eyes. My mom sees 20-20, right? She doesn't need glasses. She's better on the road, can be better on the road than I am. So it's important to treat people as individuals. And the only way we can do that, though, is when we intervene into how our implicit associations want us to immediately group them, label them, and put them in a box as important, unimportant, smart, not so smart, threatening, not so threatening. Uh, the implicit association tests that are done with pol the police are instrumental uh, in trying to intervene into their own biases in, in being sort of more likely to shoot an unarmed black person than they are a white person who's standing in front of them with an Uzi gun. I mean, it's amazing what the implicit association test uh, will uh, reveal. Uh, and so you'll get this score that'll tell you whether your associations are weak, neutral, or very strong, 
in tying a value to a particular attribute of a, of a human being. Uh, and then you can take the test any number of times. What you will find is that on days in which you are very vigilant and conscious about your implicit bias on a particular attitude, you'll be much more likely to get a neutral, a neutral score on that day. So what that means is every time you are making a hiring decision, anytime you're making an admission decision to any kind of, um, you know, club or uh, invitation uh, or in the United States where we've seen implicit biases also come to bear is because we have a, a tipping culture. Since we don't pay people a living wage, <laughs> we instead have this culture of we this also generates actually from post emancipation. Everything is about race when you dig deep in the United States. So in any case, we don't have a fair wage. We say you'll get tipped instead. But how do people tip? Studies show that people tip very much about race as well, race and gender, when they think that they've gotten good service or not. Um, even when you control for how much someone talks in a taxi cab, how much they play their loud music or don't play their loud music, all, all of that's the same. And still the white cab drivers get tipped more than black cab drivers. Okay. Um, and so what should lawyers be doing about this? They can educate themselves. They should take the implicit association test. And then they should use that to also inform uh, if they have this, if they're positioned to rethink our foundational precepts of thinking that racism and sexism and all the other problems of society are all about people's intention, explicit intentions. And instead, open up our legal doctrines to affect based systems of modes of analysis. So what we call disparate impact in the United States. Um, but uh, in the European concept, it, uh, there's also space for thinking about this as effect space. So, that, you know, if there are only two women out of 100 who are ever interviewed for the position of, let's make an extreme example, the cleaning service, right? You'd say, Hmm. And there are 50% of the population of a, of a particular location, there would be an effects based analysis you could make there. You could say, wait a minute, 50% of the working force are women. It's a cleaning position for which you do not need a medical degree uh, so that many women should be able to be considered. And you only consider two out of, out of the 100 that effects space would tell us, I don't need to know your intentions. I don't need to know whether you ever explicitly said anything about how you hate women. Your actions right, and the statistical effects tell me there's a problem here. And your own sort of desire to justify <laughs> your actions are based on, oh, but I always support women. I have daughters who I'm good to. I have a wife I'm good to. Well, good for your wife and your and your daughters, but on the job, <laughs> you're not being fair to women, right? Um, and so these are ways that um, lawyers could be um, really very helpful because once we open up our legal doctrine, our legal doctrine also helps inform how the rest of society defines things, right? When we define things narrowly, we influence the rest of society to define things narrowly. We have great influence in our uh, cultures. Um, and so there are a few, more than a few words um, that I have to say in response to your very simple, yes. simple question. But oh, I okay. think that your, your, your answer is uh, uh, an invitation to take the test, uh, first of all, uh, an invitation that all the students should accept uh, as it is free. And uh, as uh, it is online and it is easy to take, uh, this, the first thing that we should do is to invite all our students to take the test, as we did actually take the test, took the test last year when you were there. And uh, so anyway, it's something that uh, makes you think about yourself, about the way you reason about things. Well, and talk. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to interject um, on two things. One is that in addition to please take the test, um, if if Valentina has this ability, I don't know if she does within her access to the platform, but maybe if there's a, a, a chat box for the audience, she could type into the chat box for the audience, you know, Harvard University, implicit association test, et cetera. So people have it right there. Um, the other is that I also encourage people to Google um, NBC News, what was it NBC? Well, just put a implicit association test 
news interviews right? um, or after our session, I can give you the direct link. It's a, just a 15, 20 minute video of watching other people having taken the test and then being interviewed about it. What I think is useful is since you don't have me in the front of the classroom to, to talk you through it, <laughs> um, is having that news reel can show you you have company, that you're not the only one with a, a score that you will find surprising and maybe sometimes disturbing. Um, to see other people sort of be talked through how it affects all of us. If you're a part of society, you're not a hermit living under the ground and never interacting with a human being, you will be affected by our cultural mores that tell us women are not as smart, women are not leaders, and that these are things that we have to sort of directly intervene to overcome. I mean, one quick example, studies of people who are blind in the United States, so that means they literally do not see color, when you interview them and ask them about their attitudes about issues of race, they have racist attitudes having never ever seen someone's skin color. Why? Because they're still part of our society and subject to all the ways in which we teach people, however explicit and implicit, about our value systems that sort of have a pecking order about how smart and valuable we think people are according to their skin color, their race, their ethnicity, et cetera. So uh, I, I encourage people to not only do the test, but also to look at the um, news reels um, that you can find on Google that show people who have just taken the test and having the social psychologist kind of work with them uh, to sort of unpack what it all means and to show they're not bad people and to give them tools about how they can intervene in their daily lives. You don't know, you don't need to be a lawyer to be able to intervene into your implicit biases. The very first thing is becoming aware of them and then sort of being much more conscious and slowing yourself down when you're about to make a decision of any sort of significant import. But who gets tipped, who gets hired, who gets fired, et cetera. So that, that was, those are the little extra things I wanted to throw in there uh, for the audience. Of course, for of course, of course. Uh, let, let me turn to a more European side as it is a, a conversation across borders. Um, let me provoke you <laughs> with some typical Italian things uh, that I know better than any other countries in Europe. And um, let me ask your opinion on some uh, things that are happening here, because I don't think that Black Lives, hashtag Black Lives Matter is something American. It should become something more, uh, something more, universal, if you want, much more um, global. And, uh, well, in Italy, what is happening? Well, in Italy, talking about race, uh, in Italy, many Italians, I think, uh, they think that being Italian means being white. So Italian means being white, which raises, of course, the question of the many children of immigrants who have to justify their Italianness. Mm? People who are black but who were uh, born in Bergamo, in Brescia, in Napoli, in Rome, who speak with a local accent, who speak with a Milanese accent, who have the accent of Brescia, Bologna and so on, and who have to justify in front of uh, the others uh, to, of being Italian. So that uh, if a black person uh, the states. I'm from Rome in Italy. I'm quite sure that he would be, he would immediately be asked, no, but where are you really from? Mm? Because uh, it is something that uh, for the Italians uh, is, uh, uh, is, is something like a contradiction. But I think this comes out of our past because we have been a, a, a country, a country of uh, immigrants since this uh, until the 70s and all of a sudden we have become a country that receives immigrants so uh, it's not more the sicilians uh, the friulani or whatsoever who go to argentina to the united states to canada to belgium to switzerland to germany to work abroad but all of a sudden oh, oh look at that italy has become a country where many many immigrants arrive and so we are uh, even if it is I'm at least since 40 years that we should deal the, with the question, we are still there thinking about, oh no, but Italians, uh, Italians are white, of course, right? And um, so I think that uh, 
hashtag Black Lives Matter should tell us something, should teach us something. And the question I would like to ask you is, uh, what is the lesson that the European, or even more precisely <laughs> an Italian, could or should learn from hashtag Black Lives Matter? Well, <laughs> there's a lot there. Let me get started. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, he, and, what, and what I mean by that there's a lot there um, is the lesson that we're trying to teach in the United States is also the very same thing that I think would be useful in the European context. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Hashtag Black Lives Matter is trying to speak out against the presumption that black people are not really the representatives of the United States, that we are eternally foreign to the United States, yeah. despite having been brought here mm -hmm, low so many uh, centuries ago, uh, uh, despite having been in the military, fighting every in every single war. You know, there's no way, none of our patriotism ever means that we are fully citizens in the United States. You know, the, the way in which the black body is used is inherently <laughs> problematic, no matter if it's in a suit, <laughs> uh, you know, a three-piece suit and a Burberry scarf, no matter what, every black body is still inherently viewed as problematic. That That's a, that's an, that's a direct um, questioning of our citizenship. Yeah. So, Hatchet Black Lives Matter is trying to intervene into that. Now, there's another layer here as well, though. Right? Um, Hatchet Black Lives Matter generated across the globe many internal protest movements. Right? So, my own comparative perspective often looks across to Latin America, because that's where I do a lot of my sort of comparative work, U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Latin America. Uh, and Many Latin Americans were like, "What's all this?" <laughs> Seeing, uh, you know, people in Brazil with the ha with literally hash hashtag BLM Black Lives Matter, like it, it, rather than putting it into Portuguese. Sorry, and it was both a move of solidarity with the U.S., but it was also about saying because our in in Brazil in particular, it's you know, vidas negras importam, right? Black Lives Matter in Brazil itself. As vidas das favelas. The, the the lives of people black people in favelas in uh, shanty yes, town yes, 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 right? yes, yes. they matter uh, so that across the globe what you see are like these um social justice movements that had already existed but are trying to create even more visibility and space for themselves to say just like it matters in the u.s us too we're having the very same problems of being targeted by for police violence as be being viewed as less of citizens right now what is fascinating as well, right, is that like in the European context, some bodies are always viewed as internally foreign, no matter how long their families of generations have been in the United States and have been citizens of the United States forever, right? Here I'm speaking in particular about those who are Asian in the United States. Lots of writing about them being eternally foreign, right? So, you know, he, this dates me somewhat, but when gold medalist Christy Yamaguchi is back in the 1980s, so it's a bit, of, a bit of a reach for the young people in the audience, but in any case, she was a figure skater and she won medals uh, and she was the Olympic representative of the United States. She's constantly asking, you speak English so well. Where did you learn to speak English? But uh, this, is a, this girl's American as apple pie. <laughs> this expression that we use. <laughs> I don't know if she's ever been to, eat, to anywhere in Asia, right? You know, right? Born in the United States, has a, you know, regional accent from the United States. This girl's American, right? Okay. Um, but her physicality always questions her citizenship, right? And so what we have here is a parallelism. Why? Because it, even though our historical situation is different in the United States, and it's, it's, a, it's a helpful lesson, I think, in the European context, even though the historical situation in the United States is that we we are a country of immigrants, right? We have always put ourselves forth as this idea of we have people from all over the world. We are a melting pot. Everybody has some other ethnic place, you know, 
other than the Native Americans, but okay. Everybody is from someplace else. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we conveniently kind of like ignore that scenario yeah. uh, as we put forth this, um, uh, you know, narrative right, about who we are as a nation. But we have this image right, and a rhetoric about being a nation of immigrants, except when those immigrants look a certain way. So we're a nation of immigrants when we think about our Italian ancestors, our Irish ancestors, our French ancestors, our Dutch ancestors. But when it comes to somebody from Nigeria <laughs> or someone from Venezuela, et cetera, name a face that in the United States can be racialized from Korea, from China, et cetera. Uh, the Japanese in San Francisco who have been there from like the inception of when San Francisco became a serious city, always eternally foreign. Then we're no longer a nation of immigrants. So why do I say this is an important lesson from a comparative perspective? Well, the European context may think that they're struggling because they are now going through a different dynamic of, of instead being a location of exporting migrants. They are now in there's still some race going on, right? Meaning, question whether or not you would have the very same kind of situation of, of an attitude if what you had were all of these um, people from Switzerland, right? Who are not part of the European Union, thank you very much, right? Swiss, the Sw Swiss overstaying their visas. Right? Do you think that we'd have the same issue about, oh my God, they're crossing the borders. We need to evacuate them. They're taking our jobs, et cetera. That, that, that anti-immigrant um, discourse is a very racialized one, right? even in Europe. And when you can see it, when you think about the ways in which we have a very racialized discourse about immigration in the United States as well, depending on what face it is we think is crossing the border. Well, uh, something that I would like to stress is that uh, um, these, uh, there is a new association of uh, children of immigrants who were born here and uh, who uh, have uh, now invested in creating an association in order uh, to claim uh, about their Italian citizenship, but as full citizenship, not as second uh, class citizenship, of course. So they have found this association that is uh, in, in English could be without citizenship, senza cittadinanza, without citizenship. And uh, the movie, the, the docu movie that they have uh, launched very recently uh, is called I Am Rosa Parks. Fascinating. <laughs> Io sono Rosa Parks. Because the question that they ask is, who is today Rosa Parks in Italy? Mm? And so I think that uh, is uh, it's quite interesting, the fact that uh, um, I think that there are similarities and we should go on talking together in order to find out uh, uh, through these conversations uh, uh, which is the better way really to, to, to enhance awareness uh, among, the, among our young uh, students, but among also our colleagues and uh, generally speaking uh, uh, among uh, it, it, citizens from US, but also from, uh, from Italy. I would, like to, I would like to ask you a last, a very last question before going to the questions uh, from the public, from the audience, because we have, uh, we have spoken a lot about feminism and race in the United States. I was trying to speak a little bit about racism in Italy with this last question, because for, for sure there is a certain racism, racism among the Italian, always not very well understood and not fully aware of. Uh, but the, one thing that is something that is uh, really for me, it, was, it is really terrible to admit is that uh, during the last years, uh, the percentage of femicides that has characterized Italy is incredibly high. Uh, statistics, statistics show that uh, uh, this phenomenon of femicides is, has increased, is increasing, uh, 
And uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, since 1948 we have a constitution that introduces a quality principle, a lot of a series of uh, uh, norms, legislations, regulations that uh, uh, introduce the principle of equality in any kind of sector, ambit, sphere, and whatsoever. Uh, even now, even in year 2020, uh, we are still facing this uh, uh, phenomenon of uh, femicide. Femicide that is generally uh, um, a phenomenon that is committed in the couple or uh, in the family, or uh, if not in the, in the in the family or in the couple with ex, uh, with a previous partner and so on. But it's really something that... Uh, as, a, as an Italian, you have uh, uh, you have really difficulties to admit, especially if you have a daughter uh, like me. Uh, but trying to understand this phenomenon, I would like to suggest my point of view, and I would like to know if you share this uh, opinion or if you think uh, uh, we should begin to think in a different way. But my opinion is that uh, it, it is exactly this period, this generation where Italians, uh, where Italian women have really um, acquired a full uh, independence, uh, uh, not only from an economic point of view, but also from a psychological point of view, in the sense that uh, it's not a shame anymore to be alone. <laughs> it's not a shame anymore to be without children. It's not so important to become a mamma at any cost. Uh, so um, it, is, uh, uh, it is this the period where Italian women, I think, have completely become autonomous and independent from, uh, from, different, uh, from different variables that until now were characterizing um, the typical Italian woman, okay? And uh, so I think that it is exactly because of this autonomy, exactly because of this independence, that there is this wave uh, of violence against women. Because uh, I don't know if it is, I can, I'm not a sociologist, I cannot, I don't, I'm not able to say uh, uh, if this is because uh, patriarchy is nowadays completely losing its power. I'm not able to say if these is a consequence uh, of, uh, um, you know, uh, losing power from the side of men. But I'm quite sure that uh, from uh, also from a legal point of view, uh, it is exactly now the moment where all these principles since the, since the Constitution was enacted became real, became law in action and did not remain alone in the books. So... I would like to know what is the. Do, do you think this that this explanation uh, is uh, sufficient to cope with the phenomenon? Do you have any other insights that you can uh, give us? Well, you know, this issue of femicide is uh, so, so disturbing. I mean, yeah. it's disturbing to me. It's disturbing to so many. Um, and I think that another layer to consider, right, is the economy. I know that may sound very odd, right? Uh, so I'm going to just speak about from the U.S. perspective, and then yeah. maybe we can do a little back and forth about sort of uh, whether you think intuitively this is also perhaps part of the economic, uh, the, the um, European context as well. Right? Because what's interesting is that we have a conversation right now in the United States um, about the way in which COVID-19 and sheltering in place Ooh. has made women more vulnerable right now uh, to domestic violence. So we have that conversation that's happening. Yeah, we have this too. All right. Um, but what that in some respects sort of puts behind a screen for less attention is that we've actually had increasing rates right, of violence against women. Before there was anything we knew about COVID or any sheltering in oh, place, yeah. et cetera. Right? So to kind of um, unpack that just a little bit, let me just say a few things here. Um, in the United States, we actually don't have a, or at least from a legal perspective, this idea of femicide, right? Meaning if you think of femicide, it, it, um, generally speaking, it's sort of thought of as the violence against a woman because she is a woman. Mm -hmm. That can include domestic violence, certainly, but it can it can also be much broader. So femicide, more broadly, we do not have de a, a 
as much data about. We, we don't measure it uh, in the United States. What we do have data about, though, is domestic violence, or at least some data, because uh, since 1994, the, uh, uh, the U.S. has had um, a law called the Violence Against Women's Act. And with that, we make it a crime nationally uh, to, uh, to commit domestic violence and so that it's recognized as a problem as of 1994, though it existed long before that. Um, what that enables us to do, again, just with respect to domestic violence and not the much even bigger issue of femicide, and why I keep saying it's such a bigger issue is because what we see, the sociologists, the psychologists, the historians, is that when patriarchy wants to discipline women for not, and it speaks to sort of some of what you're are theorizing, when it wants to discipline women, it does so with violence, typically sexual violence. And so in times of war, women don't just don't get shot at when they're the enemy, they get raped. It's not mm -hmm. about um, a um, expression of sexual interest, it's an expression of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the same dynamic, right, is what, how we see women um, policed, if you will, regulated to be put back in their place right, is through violence. We see it in war, we see it in the workplace, we see it in the home front. Okay, so going to the data that we do have <laughs> with respect to um, domestic violence, you know, taking one place, just one little data point, but I think it quite a, uh, reveals quite a bit. Back in 2018, uh, Los Angeles County reported that they had the highest number of women uh, being killed than they had in the last decade. 2018. Hmm? Why this number? The report shows that women, while they were less likely than men to be killed in a shooting, they were much more likely to be beaten, stabbed, or strangled. And guess where that happens, you all? It's not in some dark alley from a stranger. That happens at home, right? But these are issues of domestic violence. Um, and the numbers of women killed in the United States have been steadily rising since 2014. Um, the, the data from the Violence Policy Center uh, shows that uh, women are twice as likely to be killed as men. Um, and here's another interesting part, that women who are under 29, so age matters, and women of color, including trans women, and especially trans women, and we haven't elevated that issue today, um, are disproportionately murdered you know, from that violence um, and experience some of the highest rates wow. of violence from men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the femicide stuff is, is, it's an issue, right? Now, why do I say we should think about the economy? Because I was trying to sort of theorize this for myself, and I thought, you know, how have these numbers been rising? Since the Violence Against Women Act, you know, we should see the numbers decreasing because now we're finally got law intervening, trying to enforce it, you know. OK, and here's what I think, at least in the U.S. context, this coincides at the very same time that we have growing, growing, growing deregulation of our labor. Right? That is to say, unions, the one place that we have some parallelism at times in different sectors with Europe, meaning some labor protections exist by virtue of our unionism, our trade unions. Right? Um, and with unions being dismantled slowly but surely across our labor market, men, right, working men, have fewer senses of stability in the labor market. We have much more of what's called a gig economy, meaning you don't work for a whole, a unionized taxi squad. Now you're an Uber driver, right? With no health care through your employer, uh, no pension, uh, no sick pay, right? Meaning all that economic instability, guess who, guess who pays for that at home? The women, right? All the a sense of I don't matter in the world. My wages are not secure. Um, I don't know what the, the tomorrow brings. That instability in a patriarchal society means that women are more vulnerable in the domestic violence sphere. So those are my theories about sort of why we, like in the in the European context, are seeing elevated numbers long before COVID. Right? I mean, this trend was going up uh, with the violence against women. Um, 
I think it's yes about policing women who are trying to enter spheres and be independent where they've never been before, but it's also sort of simultaneously about how a deregulated economic context um, makes men feel more vulnerable so that with the rise of women or women feeling more secure, mm. it, things combine. They combine in ways that are combustible and that put women's lives at risk. Hmm. We will think about it. <laughs> I think now it's time to have our questions from uh, uh, from the public. Uh, Tanya, thank you very much for the conversation until now, but we will go on with the questions arriving from the audience. And I will ask Valentina maybe to help us in conveying questions to Tanya and to me if there are, I don't know. Yes, so there are several questions. So I'm happy that the uh, audience is really participating. So I, I will try to, like, I will start, uh, I will go chronologically from the start. So we had the first question by Liliana Mosca, and she was asking something about the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, asking whether uh, uh, the movement includes other minorities like American Indians or Alaskan Natives, Asian, particular uh, Islanders, or just the Black movement. Okay. Well, Right. So it is true, right? That, <laughs> Good that question, black, anyway. Right? Yeah. And that brings up a number of things, right? Because, I mean, it is true that Black Lives Matter is very specific, right? It says black. <laughs> um, but it is also an inclusionary movement. Right? Often those who are in opposition uh, to Black Lives Matter will come, will respond with the retort, but all lives matter. Black Lives Matter is not trying to dispute that. If anything, Black Lives Matter is trying to make it so that all lives matter, right? Because time and time again, Black lives are the ones that are the most fragile, the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable to COVID, the most vulnerable to police violence. I mean, that Black lives are the ones that are viewed as most disposable in our society. That being said, right? Black Lives Matter is a multi-ethnic uh, coalition of people across many different groupings, including Native Americans, who um, are supporters and allies. Um, because why? When you help the those who are viewed as the most marginalized in a given context, you elevate everyone, right? Meaning when we finally get to a place where Black Lives Matter, it's not that we're gonna put some other lives but under our, our feet, right? It's that all lives will finally then matter. Um, so it, 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 I think perhaps to the European ear, having been somewhat familiar with the European discourses from, as a, from a, as being a comparatist myself, um, I know it can be, um, if you can feel some somewhat shocking <laughs> to have race so consciously put forth uh, and, and specifically blackness to be named uh, in that way, um, but it's um, done from the most humanistic and global and universalistic re, uh, um, possible sen, uh, set of motivations, right? It's actually meant to be as inclusionary as possible. And for this reason, I think it's also really useful sometimes. People say, oh, what should I read? What should I read? They wanna read new things. They wanna read all the new new uh, writing on race. And I think that's great. Since I'm part of the new wave too, I want people to buy my books as well. But I also think that they're classics that people should go back to, right? W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the most global uh, uh, thinkers uh, and, and a person of who cared about universalism. Founder of the National Association for Co Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, but he was doing so from this universalistic perspective. Right? And he spends his last years in Ghana because of the ways in which he wanted to uh, really live out these ideas of internationalism. And also the U.S. was really, really quite problematic with him, but that's a different, that's a, that's a story for a different day. Okay, so uh, I hope that uh, you gave a very like um, broad answer to the question. Then we have uh, a question by um, uh, a friend of us, that is Barbara Bello. She's uh, thanking uh, like Barbara Pozzo and Professor Hernandez for the debate. And uh, she by would, the uh, way, Barbara Bello, sorry, da, 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 I make a jingle and I make an advertisement. Da, 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 da. Okay, so uh, Barbara Bello just published a book on intersectionalità, theorie, pratiche, tra diritto, società, so intersectionality, theories and practices 
between law, uh, law and society, we, we will have to translate it for you, Tanya. <laughs> And actually, like Barbara Bello, uh, uh, question is uh, uh, about like the integration of intersectionality, both by the by both the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement. And uh, she asked, uh, as if compared with anti-racist and feminist movements of the past, intersectionality has been embraced by both current movements. So in your opinion, what are the factors that have paved the way to the broader intersectional participation in this grassroots bottom up movement? And uh, as such, and also at an unprecedented transnational level, so not only in the USA. Thank right. you in advance. And uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and I got to get that book. Um, <laughs> what I think that is useful here is to think about the role of black feminism, right? That is to say, um, the only reason why we can all talk in an international forum like this one uh, about intersectionality and all know what we're talking about, right? That it's an idea, that it's a concept that has meaning to us is because black feminism, uh, like the work of Patricia Hill Collins to be very specific, right? uh, put that word into our uh, vocabulary. Right? She's writing about this black in the 1970s. Uh, uh, Patricia Hill Collins. Then black female lawyers like Kimberly Crenshaw take that idea of black, um, of black feminism, of intersectionality, and they put it into legal analyses, right? They talk about the ways in which our legal uh, tools are deficient because they don't come from an intersectional perspective. Then people like Kimberly Crenshaw and others work in international fora, speak before the United Nations, go on Fulbright fellowships right, to export and import. Right? We have conversations across borders like these. And this is how we have intersectionality, um, an awareness of it, and then more and more women and men of interest or, you know, and our allies as well bringing it to bear in grassroots organizations and in our intellectual and scholarly endeavors as well. Right? So this is how an idea grows. Indeed, um, the, even the idea of a concept of sexual harassment, just you know, a little history lesson for a moment there, right? Sexual harassment, at least in the United States, doesn't get to be in our law right? because of legislators, not at all. Sexual harassment comes into our law because of the activism of feminists um, uh, like Catherine McKinnon, yes. who listening to the stories of women talk about how they're harassed in the workplace gives it a name. And then she gives, takes that name and she puts it into her legal briefs. And she says to the judges, judges, when women are discriminated against, as said in law, that also includes this other thing of, of sexual harassment. So we don't have legislation that says it's sexual harassment. We have legislation that talks about discrimination against women. And then feminists infuse into the, the definition of what's discrimination, the stories of black women, white women, and many others about how they're sexually harassed in the workplace. Right? Uh, so that is to say, this is how an idea takes off and then finally come, becomes to be important. Right? Step by step, like a little seed that grows <laughs> into a big flowering tree. Okay, so now we have like another question that is more connected to the first one because it's a question by uh, Sandra Nitti, that is our colleague of ours, and uh, she was saying whether uh, it is correct to say that the Black Lives Matter started as a movement for the rights of Black people is actually also a movement for the protection of disadvantage in general, such as like poor homosexual and etc. So it's not only uh, like connected with other minorities, but also with disadvantage. It is true that when one looks at um, the platform, right, you know, what are the list of asks, if you will, uh, from hashtag Black Lives Matter, the list is very inclusionary, right? The list is about 
all the people who are part of the coalition and web of concern of Black Lives Matter. So that includes issues of sexual orientation, transgender identity, ableism, right? So those who are experience disability in the world. Um, it, it is a very big tent. Then you would say, well, then why do they put black in the front of it, right? Again, so I'll, so I'll circle back to my um, a description about the ways in which the blackness is meant to be the invitation to really make all lives matter. And when you do that, you can be inclusionary and think about all the different forms of disadvantage um, and isms right, that exist within a society. Thank you. Barbara, would you like to say something? I would like to say many things. <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, do you do we, do we have other do we have other questions? Oh yes, we have many many questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh la la, oh la la, oh la la. So uh, pick up some other, and then we make, okay. because uh, it's already quarter uh, half past four, and maybe we at, at a certain point we should leave uh, to our guest uh, uh, some final conclusions and. Uh, no, there was a question by Martina Villa asking whether, according to you, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez can be uh, considered uh, a feminist icon. So it's like... Oh, uh, interesting. Um, you know, it, what's fascinating about um, um, AOC, as we like to call her, uh, oh. in the United oh. States, <laughs> We, we love it so much. We give her a nickname. That's how you know you're beloved in the United States. We we don't give you we don't call you by your full name when we shorten it. That's our sign of respect. Um, so OC um, is she often puts herself out there like from her socialist identity, right? You know that, 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 that this is how she personally identifies herself. But her actions right, show the many ways in which she's a feminist, right? She feels that women should be able to have the same respect and command leadership as any man. Um, she is unapologetic about that. And in a true feminist, she supports her sisters, right? So meaning when you see her speaking, she's there with the other women right? uh, uh, in Congress. Right? She's there supporting them and they supporting her. Um, it, I think, in, 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 at least in my own personal definition, one could certainly call her a feminist icon. Okay. Now I will intrude yeah. with a very provocative question. Sorry, but I have it in my mind since the very beginning. And what about Amy Connie Barrett? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing. <laughs> no, let, first yeah. let 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 us tell them. Let us tell our students who is Amy Connie Barrett. So. When uh, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died in September, knowing that she was dying under the Trump administration, she <laughs> repeatedly asked uh, to wait until the new administration uh, in order to um, name the next justice at the Supreme Court. And instead, uh, um, President Trump named Amy, Amy Connie Barrett, which is on my opinion, exactly the opposite of what is of what was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But I wanted to know, in a very provo I, I know that it is a provocative question, but at least one word about this uh, this situation, about this issue. Right. Well, this is the uh, a strong example of the way in which a feminist is not necessarily in a female body. Right. Um, a feminist is someone whose actions and whose attitudes demonstrate that they care about elevating all peoples, regardless of their gender identity or gender appearance. Right? Um, and that certainly is not Miss Amy. Um, you know, in, in much the same way, you know, women who are in power are not necessarily feminists. This sort of echoes back to my earlier um, reflection that. When looking at these issues about equality and what have you, some people benefit from patriarchy and some of those people who benefit from patriarchy can be women, right? That it's very situational uh, and fluid, right? So Amy has benefited from patriarchy. She's had men who've been there supporting her all the way. And so she has adopted male perspectives or maybe better put, patriarchal perspectives, because not all men embrace those perspectives either, right? Many men are and can be feminists. Right? Uh, and so 
uh, to sort of compare her to a an earlier example of this, Prime Minister Thatcher, right? promoting Thatcherism, right? much to the dismay right, of many people uh, in England. People are trying to elevate her now, but remember how we all hated her for a very long time. Right? Um, and that was no feminist. She cared about her own position as a leader, but she didn't think other women were very good leaders. Right? She didn't include women in her cabinet. Right? So um, this is the important uh, lesson, right? Is that we need to pay attention to people's actions and their attitudes, not just simply, um, and what we call in the theory, essentializing, meaning presuming that because you're in a female body, you're going to do things that promote the inclusion of all women, or that if you are in a black body, that you would be inclusionary, right? We have Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court as well, who took um, what many believe should have been the Thurgood Marshall uh, seat and kind of perverted that uh, <laughs> because he doesn't quite promote the very same mo modes of inclusion uh, as did Thurgood Marshall when he was on the Supreme Court. Uh, so those are my few words about. <laughs> Sorry the for the question. <laughs> <part appointment. laughs> so, um, one thing to say is also that there was a question exactly on uh, the Supreme Court and the role uh, of the new judge. So this was also answering another question. I didn't uh, know it was just no, a chance. No, of course, there are so many questions. I don't think we will have time like to deal with them all and. Also, like uh, there was a like a reply by Barbara Bello connected to Martina's question, and also to another question of someone else that I've been reading, but I don't. It's like writing down that is connected with Kamala Harris, and uh, as uh, she uh, as being like also considered an icon of intersectionality, could that be? And uh, on the one hand, she was attacked through very intersectional ver verbal assaults. Common use, common use against black women, mm. and so. Uh, Although she's not really <laughs> the typical black woman, right? Well, I mean, you know, she's multi-ethnic, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, her, her, Indian her, mother, I, Jamaican I, father. Exactly. Uh, and so she, that she sort of embodies multiculturalism. She also quite, she, she's an interesting figure on so many levels, right? Um, because she is a woman without children. Mm -hmm. That is also, I mean, yeah. I would think in some respect, right? it makes her even more um, aberrational than even her multi-ethnic background. Um, why? Because I, my observation is that when women are in leadership positions, Oftentimes, they have to sort of play, walk this delicate line of softening the concerns about them being in leadership roles by elevating how, as women and mothers, they will be inherently good caretakers. Right? So the stereotypes about women are often deployed by women. You know, we're trying to survive. So, you know, this is not me being judgmental. This is just me presenting facts, right, you know, observations right? that oftentimes I see women in leadership roles sort of ref sort of reflecting back to how everything good they know about leadership is because they're mothers, right, that they know how to do things. And, and you know, and I'm probably no exception as well. Like when I meet with resistance in a classroom, right, um, I'll make examples or references about my children, right, so that as if to say, don't get so mad at me being up here in the position of leadership because I'm here to take care of you and nurture you. Kamala, right? There she is. No children whatsoever. Now, from a media perspective, of course, she's had lots of pictures of her with her nieces and nephews. So to, to, again, right? Because she needs to have kind of explain herself, right? You know, like, don't worry. I can still be, you know, the mommy uh, in the White House <laughs> because I know how to take, be, I know how to be a good auntie. Um, but I think in some respects, that's even more maverick of, uh, as for her positioning. Uh. Okay. Uh, so there are there, um, connect. I try to go through the question and connect them so that we can uh, sum up. So we also have a question by Graziella Romeo that is again connected with uh, intersectionality on one side and also the Supreme Court. So she's thanking, of course, Barbara and Tanya, and she has two questions. 
one. The first one is speaking of her, the intersectionality approach. Why do you think judges seem to have problems in really taking such an approach? Mm -hmm. What is the miss is missing here? The empathy of the law or the persistent inconsistency of anti-discriminatory arguments? And the second question is connected like with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, uh, some implicit bias. How is feminism in the Supreme Court doing now? Mm -hmm. Because on like on her point of view, neither Ruth Bader Ginsburg nor Sandra O'Connor were entirely embracing a broad feminist approach. So these are the two questions. Yes. Um, uh, just to so, tell you, Tanya, uh, Graziella Romeo is a fantastic colleague of Bocconi University who teaches a course on, uh, uh, you know, uh, women's rights uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in today's society. So that is also why she's she she asked such a very intriguing question. <laughs> um, so with respect to the first question, right? Um, why is law or judges in particular? Why are they so? so perturbed or confused sometimes or uh, resistant to this idea of intersectionality. Um, I think, and many have written about the ways in which law's categorical approach to discrimination informs this resistance, right? So when we think about discrimination, at least in the United States, but I see this also across um, uh, in a comparative perspective, we think about it in categories, meaning were you discriminated against because you are a woman, because you are from a racial background, because you're from a religious background, right? So we, like we separate it out. Okay, so that's one kind, that's one claim to make, race, another claim, gender, another claim, religion, and so on and so forth, right? If there's an age complaint, it, that's another category. And uh, as, as a result, judges like for the claims to be neatly packaged, Right? And so to look for sexist commentary for the gender court claim, racist commentary for the race claim, so on and so forth. But you know what? Real life is not like that. <laughs> in real, in real, the real world, right? Human beings come in a particular package that's a mixture, right? And so what intersectionality seeks to do, and some people say, well, then what should we do? We can't have like, you know, all these fractional ways of looking at uh, identity and law. It's quite the opposite. <laughs> instead, right? Instead, what we should be looking at is sort of holistic frames right? that look at what? That look at the ways in which disparate effects are occurring in ways that are problematic. Or if you're looking just at the one individual, you can ask her, the law can ask, right? Was this person differentially treated? as opposed to everyone else in the workplace, right? Or an access to housing or, you know, wherever discriminatory uh, context that you are looking at. Um, there's there's a way that we can work our way through this um, to be more inclusionary and have intersectional perspectives rather than an oversimplistic, or dare I say it, black versus white <laughs> kind of approach of a stark uh, categories in which there's an idea that the, two cat that the categories can't be overlapping. Oh, so that was the first question. The second question, I'll be uh, m much more concise since I know that our time is um, coming to a close uh, with regards to uh, the Supreme Court and feminism. I think that's an excellent question, right? Yes, um, yes uh, because it is true, right? To, to, to be in a female body is not necessarily always to be uh, fully encompassing of all feminist perspectives, right? Um, and, you know, that can include both, you know, the icon that we now know of, of this Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, uh, or, the, is, or we not, because she has a nickname to you all, a notorious RBG, um, along with the, you know, the newest member uh, and, and the other women on the, on the, on the Supreme Court. Um, and so, yeah, I don't have a crystal ball, I'm a, but I do have to say that I am somewhat fearful right, about what the future holds with regards to how Supreme Court rulings will occur um, and what many uh, social justice uh, movement actors are doing who work within the spheres of law, right, is that they're trying not to go to the Supreme Court, right? You know, we're trying to do this within various local courts that are a little bit more hospitable. Um, and, and hoping that, you know, we can wait it out until a better day <laughs> and a better array of judges uh, can do justice. Okay. 
So um, I, w I just picked up a question because I find it uh, like it's an another perspective because like it's from a, um, Simone who is a neuroscience and psychology student. So I found that like like a, uh, having like a, this like very very nice uh, different uh, perspective. But what would you think if scientific literature would find out that there is a biological base on of physiognomical discrimination? Thinking about the example you made before of the color blind children. I will say that a possible interpretation could be an evolutionary mechanism for, for team tribe group, group recognition. Evolution rarely promotes collaboration and human history makes no exception. Not trying to justify racism, just like an uh, observation, but I found it like a different kind of remark. Right. So. Well, you know, here's what's interesting. Um, when people get trained uh, to do um, leadership uh, sessions. Right? Uh, often part of the training is how to do um, group building right away right? Uh, within a group collection of people who are in the session who don't know each other, right? You know, co-workers, uh, workers across uh, an industry or what have you. Um, and part of what uh, is uh, builds group building is putting people into opposing teams. That it and what is discovered is that that forms very quickly. Uh, it, it, not, whether it's evolutionary or you know social psychology, that that's above my pay grade. Um, but it is a dynamic right, that consistently occurs. But here's the thing: while that may be our inclination, our intuition, that doesn't mean it is our destiny. Right? Meaning there are interventions. Right? So e e whether you want to call it biological or not. It doesn't mean that we have to be predisposed right, to having all our whole society arranged in that way. Right? You know, you know, just because the female body is capable of giving birth, right, doesn't mean our entire society should be organized on making sure that women are excluded from every other sphere other than giving birth. Right? So there's biology, and that's important and it's informative, right? um, but it doesn't mean that it should preordain and predetermine right, how we choose. Right? to have egalitarian societies. Um, and, and, and I'll give you one other example. Um, there's something that's called the blue eye, um, brown eye experiment. And it's of this kindergarten teacher oh, who, who is pretty famous for um, creating uh, scenarios in which Oprah Winfrey did an episode of her show of this. So if you put, yeah. plug in into Google, Oprah Winfrey and blue eye, uh, excuse me, blue eye and brown eye, you'll get it right away. And basically what she did is she did a little, little experiment that she filmed where the people who were lined up to come in to see her show, you know, back when the line used to go around the block, around her studio in Chicago in the United States, and they only let in people who had brown eyes. And even if you were the front of the line, people with blue eyes had to wait. And so they were in the back of the room and they had the worst seats, et cetera. And they started to notice or someone, you know, kind of like seeped it out and they got more and more animated. And as they got more and more animated about the in inequality, the people with the brown eyes started to try to justify it. Well, you know, well, everybody knows that, you know, we're much more um, well behaving and, uh, you know, that we have greater intellect than people with blood. I mean, it was insane. Right? So. <laughs> It, whatever this dynamic is of people trying to build group esteem right, for them as an individual based on whatever they're or however they're paired off into a group, um, it, it happens, it ha can happen fast and it can happen on any kind of arbitrary characteristic, but you can also intervene. Right? Um, and so once it was brought to light, you know, they could all be like, oh, wait a minute, what were we thinking? What were we doing? Um, it's a fascinating episode of the Oprah Winfrey show. I highly recommend because it has a, lot to, has a lot to do with this issue of implicit bias as well. Uh, so we, we have many other questions. I don't know, maybe I could just some like two together because there were two or three concerning transgender people. Mm -hmm. And they are as they are considered particularly vulnerable subjects, and the fact that also maybe the Black uh, Lives Matter uh, movement didn't like highlight that 
so much. So like when there are like there are transgender women that were like Mia Green that were, was killed because she was black transgender, that was not really stressed by and on, on, on also other like kind of other accidents. Well, here's the thing. Um, black Lives Matter, the three co-founders, the women, right? They include out queer black women. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, so sexual orientation is definitely part of their consciousness, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And their platform. Uh, what I want to disaggregate, though, is that what their web of concerns are: trans identity, queer identity, etc. From what the media focuses on. Yes. But when uh, it yes, yes, one. Mm -hmm. When it talks also about. There was, there was also a question about like the influence of media. So that's also oh. that you can talk. Yeah. About. So, you're, so it's a disaggregating what Black Lives Matter cares about and what the media says Black Lives Matter cares about, right? So that um, the Black Lives Matter will speak out on a website, you know, will put out their um, uh, positions of, uh, of concern about uh, uh, occurrences of violence that happen that are intersectional in these many different ways, and the media will just pick up the blackness part. Right? Uh, so I, I, I guess I... Um, in a concise manner, we just simply say Black Lives Matter it has a much broader web of concerns consciously uh, and is much more inclusionary than the media portrays it. Yeah. Well, I don't okay. know how many questions we still have. Um, many, I think. Yes, still many questions. So we, we have to decide whether do you have, do we have like still time or do you think uh, well we have time for one and at least one and uh, another one and then so we should conclude and also leave the possibility to tanya to get to say something maybe yes uh i think that uh there was also a question like on a comparative perspective connected with uh, uh canada because uh, the, there is like um uh, alexandru gravilescu i don't know whether i said it like correctly who is a flight attendant and is that been traveling to USA and uh, Canada. And she has a remark saying that she didn't see much debate about gender and race matters in Canada. And she was, wonder was wondering whether it's just uh, like uh, something she considers the two countries as close culturally. So wondering whether they have less discrimination or a different approach to the questions, if you know something about that. I know a little bit about that. Uh, like a Renaissance man, I know a little bit about many things. <laughs> <laughs> like a Renaissance woman. <laughs> well, that's, I wanted to highlight how men will do this. Like, of you know, course. They, they feel free to talk about any topic, right? <laughs> sort of this idea, like, they inherently, you know, have something valuable to say about any topic. Um, but, you know, kidding aside, this is an interesting thing about the Canadian perspective that I think it is a is one that um, suffers from what I consider a Latin American kind of dynamic. What do I mean by that? Very close geography, same continent, right, with the United States, but it that proximity also enables a kind of sense of superiority. And deflection. That is to say, we're not the place of racism, Canada, Cuba, Mexico, you know, name a region, right? Uh, uh, I should say, name a country within the region in both North and South America and Central America, et cetera. Right? We're close to the United States, so we can we have our eye on them and we can see that they're the place of real racism. We, in contrast, are so enlightened. We're not like the United States. What that does though, right, in trying to sort of have this constant differentiation and sense of superiority, that it completely shields from view all the ways in which there are Canadians of color who have a very different perspective. Uh, so it's part of my work uh, 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 as a comparatist. I've also collaborated with people from McGill University uh, in Montreal. Right? And in the work that I've done with them, you know, I've been taught right, and have learned quite a bit about the ways in which Afro-Canadians right, and other marginalized communities within Canada don't sing the same happy song <laughs> about how enlightened Canada is. Um, so there's that. Um, that being said, Canada is different in, what, in a way that I find very interesting with regards to their law. Right? They don't uh, 
use the same categorical approach that the United States does. Uh, in Canada, their uh, human rights law talks about inequality as including the basis that we all do of, you know, gender and race and ableism, et cetera. Um, but they talk, they, they imbue it as being about um, a holistic examination, right? So that the categories are, uh, by example, they're not to be limited, right? So that a person can say, look, this was about an issue of discrimination and let me describe to you all the ways in which it was, as opposed to having to say, I fit into this one box and it's definitely only about this race box. So that's, I've always found that sort of a fascinating um, differential approach um, about the Canadian law, right? Um, but as far as how it promotes itself, it has much in common with many other countries that likes to use the United States as a comparator um, for the perverse purposes of promoting themselves and hiding, um, veiling from view their own sins <laughs> with regards to discrimination. Well, yes, I think that, uh, so uh, I just wanted to, ooh, la la, I just wanted to tell you how many students and other people have followed your, our conversation. So, so more than 500 people were connected. So I think that is a very good, uh, good result. So I think this is the silver line and of the, of our cloud <laughs> being the, the, the cloud the pandemic. Uh, I think it was very nice to have you here and the, in this pro with this broad audience. And at the same time, I also wanted to share a message that I have received from the uh, Italian president of the uh, uh, of this association Ter Optimist International that she was saying great I was moved <laughs> so uh, I think that was a very a very nice uh, moment with you Tanya uh, I really would like to thank you for being uh, with us and for sharing this moment and uh, for always being so uh, ready to participate to, uh, with, uh, to, with us and uh, to uh, our initiatives. I immediately would like to say also that next year you should come in person anyway. <laughs> I, I really hope that the pandemic is not going to last until the month of May so that we are hopefully having you here in Italy in, in the month of May to lecture our students and maybe we can even try to uh, to reorganize a webinar uh, in order to um, to keep in touch with all the people who have uh, followed us uh, uh, today. So I would like to thank uh, the audience who has followed us. Thank Valentina, who is always precious uh, in any in any respect. And especially, again, thank to Tanya Hernandez for having been here with us today. Thank you, Professor Hernandez. And uh, Let's hope to see you <laughs> in Italy next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was a great pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, and to all the 500 people who stayed with us for the entire time, thank you. Um, I, I would love if you would follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> My Twitter handle uh, is at Professor TKH. And that's Professor with the English spelling. So P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R. -S -S Professor TKH, uh, and we can converse. We will there. follow you. We will follow you. <laughs> and uh, also, if I can give an advice to our students, uh, 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 Professor Hernandez has a beautiful web page with uh, a, a, um, a list of uh, her writings uh, and some of the articles you can even download. And that is something that uh, could be interesting for you. I'm talking also about uh, um, writing a thesis uh, uh, in connections with the issues that with the subjects that we have treated uh, today and that we will uh, again um, deal with uh, in the second semester with uh, our course that is dedicated to the UNESCO chair. So thank you, every, thank you everybody and uh, thank you to Tanya especially. Bye bye. Thank you bye. very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye.